Hello and welcome back to my channel. For those of you new here, hello, my name is Skylar. I am a certified dog trainer and pet nutritionist. Today we are going to be doing another video where I, a certified dog trainer, lend some experience and some advice to some dog and cat related am I the asshole questions. Am I the asshole is a subreddit on the website Reddit where people can tell their stories, state their case, and ask other users whether or not they were the asshole in that situation. Users then get to decide, yes the asshole, not the asshole, no assholes here, etc. to help some delusional people be put in their place and help navigate some dicier circumstances. This is the second video that we have done on Reddit Am I the Asshole? So if you haven't watched the first video, go ahead and check that out. Throughout the video, I'm going to be reading out the stories and giving some of my personal opinions about what's going on, as well as maybe some advice if it's applicable. But I'd love to hear from you guys what you think, whether or not you agree with me, if you don't, any insights that you might have on the situations, and we're gonna keep those comment sections fun and engaging. So definitely, as you're watching the video, feel free to use that comment section below. Our very first story, am I the asshole for calling my husband delusional when told me to take one of my girls' rooms and turn it into a nursery for the baby? My husband, Chris, and I live in a four-bedroom house. I have two daughters, 16 and 10, and each have their own room. My older daughter needs privacy, the third room is for me and my husband, and the fourth room is for his dog. Now with a baby on the way, we've been going back and forth on where we should put the nursery. My husband flat out said that his dog's room was off limits and casually asked me to pick one of the girls' rooms and have them share a room. I was shocked when he suggested that. I argued with him asking if he was serious about his suggestion, then called him unreasonable. He yelled at me saying I could not be actually shocked and calling him the unreasonable one when my 10 year old daughter has a room all to herself. I flipped and called him delusional and had a big argument and then stopped talking to each other. He's pissed saying I clearly think so little of his dog to be so willing to kick him out of his room, then reminded me of whose house this is, which I thought was uncalled for and unfair since I've been paying more towards the mortgage and all that. Am I the asshole for my reaction? BTW, the girls are stepdaughters, not biological daughters. He even made a comment about asking their bio dad to pay to build a room in the house. Of course he was being sarcastic. The original poster then goes to add some additional information to make the situation a little bit more clear and says, He's had him four plus years, he's overprotective of him, and there's always a fuss in the house because he thinks that my family and friends scare the dog and give him bad vibes, and so he provides him with his own space. Dog sleeping most of the time in that room doesn't even do anything with all the stuff my husband put inside. Basically wasted space in my opinion. It's been like this since my girls and I moved in. It's his house, there isn't much I could do to change it. Also, my 16 year old isn't having it. She's telling me that she'd go to live with her grandma if this scenario happens, which makes it even worse now I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. Even before this happens, he's always thought it'd be better if the girls shared a room, but I insisted on my older getting a room to herself. He thought that he would divide the girls and put distance between them, but in my opinion, a 10 year old and a 16 year old sibling don't spend much time together anyway. Exceptions when an older is watching her sister when I go out of town. To those who are suggesting we put the dog and baby in one room, I'm not sure I'll agree on this compromise. While the dog is pretty much quiet and no active, I have concerns, and for the record, the dog's room is the smallest in the house, followed by my younger daughter's room, then her sister's room, then our bedroom. He suggests we put the nursery in the bedroom as a last resort, but I refused. There's a lot to unpack in this particular story and I think it's important for me to state for myself that I am a dog trainer and not a family therapist as much as sometimes in my line of work it kind of seems that way. So we're not gonna go too deep into the blatant and very prevalent this father does not see the kids as his own and possibly less than than his dog and that's a whole issue in addition to the eldest daughter. There's a lot to unpack in this particular story and I think it's important for me to state for myself that I am a dog trainer and not a family therapist as much as sometimes in my line of work it kind of seems that way. So we're not going to go too deep into the blatant and very prevalent this father does not see the kids as his own and possibly less than than his dog and that's a whole issue. In addition to the eldest daughter thinking that you know moving out of the house completely and separating herself from this family if the dog were given a room over anyone else like that all applies that this is probably an ongoing thing with a lot of more complex history 
to it. That being said, there are some relevant dog scenarios in this story that I think are really worth talking about. First of which, should your dog be given a room of their own in the house? Is that normal? Is that, you know, something that should be recommended or alternatively, should that be condemned? And I think it personally depends on your situation, your home life, and your dog. If there are other people in the home that could use that extra space, I think the people should probably have that extra space. If it comes down to, we have a baby on the way and we need a room for the baby, the baby should have the space other than the dog. Does that mean the dog should not have a space where they feel comfortable to retreat to? Because as the poster pointed out earlier, you know, the dog feels uncomfortable when friends or family comes over and tends to spend more time in that room. I think that that is a great option if you have friends or family coming over, if you have a more nervous dog, if you just don't want to deal with hosting guests and monitoring your dog. All of those things, a great and perfect excuse to allow them to have somewhere else to go. You should absolutely have somewhere safe and out of the way where your dog can retreat to if they're uncomfortable in whatever situation they're in. Does that need to be a room of their very own? Absolutely not. In this scenario, you know, if you have the four bedroom house and you have kids in three of the four, you know, having a dog bed or a crate or a kennel in your bedroom, instead of the baby being in your room, having it in your bedroom would be a great option to give the dog time to go decompress, hang out away from people. Your guests probably aren't going into your bedroom while you're hanging out and hosting a party or hosting family. And so that would be a great option for the dog. Additionally, the suggestion of having the dog and the baby kept in the same room is absolutely a recipe for disaster. I do not care how well behaved your dog is. I do not care how great their history with children has been. I do not care about any of those things because the reality of the situation is, even while supervised, the margin of error between baby and dog is huge and the risks associated with having bad interactions between the two is again huge. So I don't know if it was ever on the table that like the baby and dog are in the same room unsupervised. But if that's the case, we need to really reassess um, either a lack of knowledge of the topic or blatant disregard for safety. The reality of the situation is, and honestly, TikTok trends are a great example of this. Most humans don't know enough about how to read dog body language and how to navigate those situations to keep themselves and their pets safe. If people don't have the ability to tell and respect when their dog is uncomfortable, when their dog is fearful, when their dog is about to lash out as a last resort, we can't expect that of children. Most cannot read dog body language. You should supervise children when around dogs. Most incidents of dog bites to children are from a dog that's either their own family dog or the dog of friend or family members. Anytime that a child is interacting with a dog, it should be supervised by a parent who knows about dog body language, who can then interfere if they start to notice increases of inappropriate activity. And the kids should also be taught how to safely interact with dogs to prevent, you know, pulling the ears, trying to ride on them, approaching a dog that has a toy or a treat. All of those sorts of things, which yes, your dog might have a perfect history of never having an issue with, you never know. Always supervise children. Unfortunately, the majority of the stories that we hear of horrific dog bite incidents or deaths because of dog attacks are infants because they can't defend themselves, they don't know any better, and there's a lack of understanding or a lack of precaution on the parts of everyone in the household. And unfortunately, it's not the dog's fault. Just from a behavior standpoint, the research that has been done on dog behavior, there's always something. It's never a surprise. It's never out of the blue. There's always a history of something or something in the environment that can push them to that point. Overall, do I think that this husband is a complete asshole for being so adamant that his dog should have its own separate room? when there's a baby on the way and trying to force two siblings into the same room? Absolutely. 
Our next story, am I the asshole for telling my fiance she can either have me at her wedding or her best friend and their dogs, and we'd get married at a courthouse. Jessica, 30 female, and I, 29 male, are getting married next year. We've been doing the wedding planning, got places and things picked out. It's been going good until we hit the snag. Abby is Jessica's best friend and maid of honor. Both love dogs, both have dogs. When we started talking about the wedding, Jessica told me all about this plan they both had. When each of them got married, they'd have a doggy wedding ceremony. They'd have a doggy wedding ceremony between their dogs and their future husband's dogs at the same time. I don't have a dog, not a dog guy, so there's no potential for that to happen. I like her dog enough and let her do what she will with him, but I do give him, get him treats and toys sometimes. I thought that would be the last I heard of that. She and Abby started to talk about how cute it would be to include both their dogs in our wedding party. Not my thing, but I have friends and family that have done something similar, and I want her to enjoy the day, so I said okay, thinking that they'd just be up at the altar or something like that. Nope, they want their dogs to get married during our wedding. I wasn't too keen on the idea and raised concerns, like what would they do with both dogs the rest of the day? What if the venue we picked didn't allow pets? We went back and forth and I agreed that we could do their dog ceremony at the end of our ceremony. A couple weeks later, Jessica and Abby bring it up again. They want parts of the reception to be dedicated to their dog's friendship. Shit like puppy picture slideshow, a cake for them, dog friendly favor bags because they want their friends and family to bring their dogs too. I told them no and that I already made one compromise on the issue and didn't want a bunch of dogs around for our entire wedding and reception, and that if they did that, we'd have to find an all new venue probably. I reminded her that we were near the limit of what she could contribute towards our wedding funds and I'd be paying the rest and I don't want to pay extra for stuff for a bunch of dogs. They both said that this was really important to them, so I told Jessica point blank, we can stick to what we originally agreed to or she and Abby could have their costly party that allows dogs by themselves and we'd get married at the courthouse by ourselves. Abby told Jessica I was being manipulative and making ultimatums and wanted her to go stay at her place until OP pulls his head out of his ass. Jessica didn't go and we're still going back and forth. She still wants things her way and feels I'm being too selfish. I don't think I am because I want an enjoyable wedding and marriage with Jessica, not Jessica and Abby and their pets. Am I the asshole? So first of all, personally, um, I think that would have been a deal breaker about five steps ago where the dogs got married, period. Um, the suggestion of I want my dog to marry your dog at the altar at our wedding would have been a red flag for me personally. If that sounds cute to you, absolutely do your thing as long as you and your partner are on the same page. Have so much fun, send me pictures. Now I think we can all safely say that the requests of the fiance and her friend are extreme. Um, she wants the friend and the fiance's dog to get married at the altar during their wedding ceremony after their ceremony's already happened. So like you may kiss your partner and then please hold for a second while we begin the ceremony for the dogs. And then to have a whole portion of your reception dedicated to the dogs, dog cake, uh, have guests bring their dogs. All of those things, again, if you and your partner are on the same page with that, awesome. However, sounds like this guy is definitely not a fan of this idea whatsoever. I am going to take this as an opportunity to talk about dogs at weddings though, because I think that that's coming into popularity and I have some opinions about the logistics of it. I am a dog trainer. I am a pet nutritionist. I have been working in the pet industry for like five, six years at this point. I have been working around dogs for the past decade. I love dogs. I love my dogs. However, I personally have had a lot of mixed feelings about this whole dogs at weddings scenario. And a big part of it is the logistics of it. Me personally, I, when I have my dogs around me, I'm focused on my dogs. If we go visit someone's house, I'm not able to fully enjoy the company of that other person because I am monitoring my dogs. I'm monitoring their dogs if they have dogs. I am watching the situation to see if there's any intervention that needs to be made, if there's any management that needs to be put in place. I don't know if that's just a me knowing too much about things that could go wrong or just, I'm pretty sure just a personality thing um, on my part of just, I want to be aware of what's going on and in control of the situation. So I personally don't think that when I get married, there's going to be any dogs involved. If anything, and I've seen a couple trainers that do this service, having them for the ceremony, if you really want like a dog ring bear, a dog flower 
dog, whatever. Having another trainer on hand, and not just a family member, like that's cool, but like hire a professional would be ideal to manage the dog, to take the dog away. Maybe it's like a training and then dog sitting service where they come, they stay for the ceremony, monitor the dog so that way none of your guests are burdened with it, none of your wedding parties burdened with it, you're not burdened with it. You have a professional, just like your photographer, just like your wedding planner, there to handle the dog. Once the ceremony's done, once pictures are done, etc., once you've done what you need to do with your dog, they just leave and maybe watch your dog for you until the next morning when you pick them up or you have a deal where they keep them for the honeymoon, whatever. That would be the perfect ideal scenario where I personally would feel comfortable having a dog at my wedding. Those are my personal feelings about the situation. I would love to hear what you guys think about dogs at weddings. Um, and not that I think very many people are going to be coming to the fiance's defense here, but if you do, if you think that I'm totally out of line for saying all these things, let me know that too. Our very last Am I the Asshole of the video is a cat question actually. I, 20 male, broke up with my girlfriend, 21 female, because she wanted to declaw the kitten. When we were together, my ex got a kitten. Everything was good at first, but then she got really irritated because the kitten was scratching up her furniture and wanted to have her declawed. I did some reading and told her that it's basically amputating her, showing her articles about how it is cruel and painful. She didn't change her mind. Her response was that it deserves it for tearing stuff up. I told her that if she really is that annoyed, she can sell her to me, and she did. After buying the kitten, I ended it with her. It hurt because we were together since we were 18, and I actually crushed on her for much longer than that. But then I reminded myself of what she wanted to do to the little kitten. Even now, I couldn't fully grasp how someone I really loved wanted to do anything like that, but I'm relieved I managed to prevent it from happening. Now I'll admit, this one's less of an am I the asshole situation, but we're gonna throw it in the video anyway because I think that it's a good thing to talk about. So let's phrase it as this. Was this guy in the wrong or overreacting for breaking up with his girlfriend because she wanted to declaw the kitten? When it comes to any kind of thing with your pets, I personally recommend doing research from credible sources, talking to your vet, talking to the breeder if you got your cat from a breeder, um, going online and again looking at credible sources there's a lot of misinformation in the pet world because quite frankly the majority of it is just the wild west no credentials are required no licensing is required for a lot of things so doing well-rounded research and really finding those sources that cite evidence that is backed up by scientific findings it's gonna be really important with that said Declawing is one of those things where there's increasingly every day more information of how it is harmful to cats. When you declaw a cat, they do have to basically amputate part of the toe in order to remove the claw and declaw that cat. One reason that you should not declaw your cat, besides the fact that it is a amputation of the toe, is that because it is an amputation of the toe, they're more likely to get early onset arthritis in their paws. And most cats eventually, if they get old enough, are gonna develop some arthritis in their paws, which is not great, not very comfortable, a little painful, and can drastically change their behavior as they age. To purposely speed up that process of getting arthritis in their feet is a moral decision for you to make and I personally do not agree with. Secondly, your cat's claws do a lot for them. Even if you have an indoor cat, which I really, really, really recommend having an indoor cat as opposed to an indoor outdoor or an outdoor cat, if something were to happen, that cat gets out, they've just lost pretty much all ability to defend themselves against whatever may come for them. Number one defense mechanism. If your cat is indoor, outdoor, or an outdoor cat and you declaw that cat, that is a immediate death sentence. The amount of times that I hear the neighborhood strays fighting outside my window, if one of them did not have claws, I would not be hearing that sound anymore and it would be a very sad day for whoever has that cat. There are a ton of things that you could be doing instead of declawing your cat if the scratching, whether your skin or furniture, is an issue to you. First of all, for everything you don't want your cat scratching, you should have at least two accessible yes options within reach. For example, making sure you have ample scratching posts, ample cat trees, ample things that they can do to distract themselves rather than just taking it off on the couch. Scratching is one of those things that is a necessary skill and a necessary behavior for cats. 
It helps to shorten the nails. It helps to spread scents through glands in their paws. Cats are going to scratch whether we want them to or not. So we want to give them ample opportunities to do that in an appropriate way. If your cat's claws are sharp and that's a concern of yours, maybe because you're older and your skin's really thin, you have young children, um, you have antique furniture that you should maybe just put in a room where the cat doesn't go in, any of those reasons, there are a couple options for you. The absolute easiest that I personally find is the most effective and realistic is to just trim your cat's nails. I personally don't have a cat right now. My sister does have a cat. You've probably heard me talk about Chowder if you've watched some of my other videos where I mention cats. Um, my sister has a cat, Chowder. We all love Chowder. Chowder's a... love that cat. Every time I see Chowder, I cut her nails. With cats, you don't need to go to make them super short like dogs, really just clipping off the very tip. So if you're inexperienced with clipping nails, just the very, very tip and you're gonna be fine. That helps to blunt the edge, which makes them less sharp. The cat can still defend themselves in theory if something were to happen or go wrong, but they aren't gonna be as sharp. They're much nicer when the cat jumps off of you and so you're not having that piercing nail digging into your skin. And it's the best, in my opinion, compromise between I want you to have your nails because it is important and it's like literally a part of you um, compromised with they're an inconvenience to me. And ultimately, the way I see things is safety is the number one priority, always. Safety for myself, safety for what animal I'm working with. Number two is comfort. The comfort of myself and the comfort of the animal. Safety is the number one priority. Nails and claws are a safety thing. At the end of the day, they are safety. If they're an inconvenience to you, maybe you shouldn't have a cat. If they're an inconvenience to you, maybe you shouldn't have a cat. Or you should find an alternative that allows the cat to remain safe and whole while still meeting your needs and managing these behaviors. The other option, if you are interested in clipping your cat's nails, is to get the little claw caps. I personally don't have any experience with the little claw caps. Um, I have a friend who's a groomer who one of the services she does, not very often, but sometimes, is to put those on. Um, basically, it's like a little plastic or rubbery stopper that you stick on the nail so the cat's claws can still retract um, a little bit, but it just has like a little child safety bumper on the nail. Um, that's something that I would recommend doing more research about, talking to a vet about, um, talking to somebody who specializes in cats and has more experience in that realm than I do. Declawing is also one of those procedures that is becoming illegal in a lot of places and that a lot of vets will refuse to do. There are other procedures, I can think of a handful for dogs, that are going in that direction as well, whether the vet just won't do those services, or states, cities, counties, countries are outlawing them completely. And as an animal welfare advocate, I am honestly a huge fan of that becoming the trend because the majority of these procedures are unnecessary, have more health risks than benefits, um, and can be managed by other venues that aren't invasive rather than being seen as an inconvenience or a fashion trend and being dealt with accordingly. So that is all for today's Am I the Asshole? Be sure to like this video if you enjoy watching these types of videos. I can absolutely continue to do them as long as we like watching them. Um, be sure to leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think of any of the topics we discussed in this video, what you thought of these stories and these people. Um, keep it nice and scientifically correct if you could. That'd be... We don't need misinformation spreading and we don't need arguments. But definitely let me know what you think down below. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. If you're new here, um, hello, welcome. Kind of a weird video to start with, but welcome. I do a lot of training and nutrition videos over here. You can also follow me on Instagram if you would like between uploads. I have two different Instagram accounts. Tattoo.dogtrainer for more personal stuff. And at Top Dog Behavior is my business page, so you're gonna get more nutrition and training info over there. And I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.